What is David Fincher talking about when he says this? I think people are perverts. I've maintained that. That's been, I, that's the foundation of my career. What are his movies about? A movie about a website? A movie about masculine identity? A movie about conspiracy? A movie about a serial killer? And a movie about a man who ages backwards? Don't seem to have much of a connection. But every David Fincher movie examines the same thing. Information. David Fincher is obsessed with it. How it's misused. How it misleads. How it manipulates. And how it corrupts. Gone Girl is no different. Gone Girl is Fincher examining what our relationship to information is and essentially asking a question. When the lie is preferable, does the truth really matter? In Gone Girl, Fincher tells us that he believes that the world would prefer to believe an acceptable lie over an uncomfortable truth. People who see this movie often don't see the truth, they see their version of it. Reviews of the movie make this perfectly clear. Natalie Wilson from Miss Magazine stated Gone Girl is the crystallization of a thousand misogynist myths and fears about female behavior. While Times' Eliana Docterman said it was a sexist portrayal of a crazy woman and John Smith of The Guardian said she saw the movie as recycling rape myths. I imagine this response would have been exactly what Fincher wanted. One half of an audience will see a cheating husband neglecting and abandoning a sacrificial wife, who is somewhat justified in acting out against a cheating, lying, absentee husband. The other half will see a husband who tried to give his wife everything, a wife who turned into the very thing he warned the readers of his magazine column against, a nagging, controlling wife. A wife who was a hindrance to his happy life instead of facilitating it. A wife so difficult that she pushed him into the arms of another woman. Fincher heavily relies on most of the audience agreeing, at least in part, in two stereotypes. Women are controlling and crazy, and men are cheating, lying bastards. And depending on who you are, and what you believe as an individual, it will reflect which of those two stories you accept and believe. The problem isn't that they're both wrong. The problem is, we don't care if they're wrong. The opening sequence of Gone Girl sets us up to be misled. It begins by presenting our two lead characters' perspectives. Nick is a man who doesn't understand his wife, but really wants to. And Amy is a woman madly in love with her husband. These are the first two pieces of information that we receive, and depending on who you are and what you believe, you'll instantly pick a side. But this is a clever use of this information because neither perspective is true and they're both simply used to reinforce our preconceived stereotype. This continues as we learn how these characters met and who they perceive themselves to be. Their first meeting is a performance with both people adopting the role of what they think the other one will find attractive, without ever really being honest about who they are. Despite them both recognising this as a performance designed to attract the other, they both continue the charade unaffected by the lack of sincerity, and we as the audience do the same. We find their banter charming, engaging, maybe even a little funny, but we don't ever find it insincere. We know it's a lie, because it's too perfect to be true, but we decide to believe the lie. We want to believe that this fun and sexy back and forth is what love and attraction really is. So this is what we accept. Later we get the same thing again during Nick's proposal in which they again both perform their roles for a crowd. This whole scene feels scripted and snappy like something written by Aaron Sorkin. And interestingly, the scene is framed in front of an actual audience of people captivated by its charm and wit, ready to believe that this is what love really looks like. Just like us. We know the truth, real life romance is never this snappy, but we would rather believe the lie. 
Every time we receive new information throughout the movie is presented to us with the goal of reinforcing cliched stereotypes. Fincher wants our bias near the surface, so we can challenge it. If you believe Nick's version of events, that Amy is a cold, indifferent, yet nagging wife, it's contradicted by Amy's retelling of their happy, excited marriage. If you believe Amy's version of events, that Nick slowly became an abusive spouse fueled by inadequacy, then it's contradicted by Nick's genuine confusion and concern at where his wife is. Our perception and biases are fueled again when it's revealed that Nick has been having an affair with an attractive young college student. Suddenly, Nick is no longer sympathetic. Suddenly, Nick becomes the embodiment of negative male stereotypes held by some corners of the audience, and they begin to believe that Nick really did kill her. As more and more information is revealed about Nick, his reliance on his wife's trust fund, his frequent decision making without discussing her, and his practice of using her body for his own relief, we begin to consistently have those biases reinforced. And maybe some people in the audience begin to think that Amy is right to frame her cheating husband as he clearly didn't respect or appreciate her at all. It doesn't matter that she's committed a crime, because maybe he deserves it, and maybe she deserves her freedom. This scene is maybe the most interesting scene in the whole movie. In this scene we see Amy telling the narrative that everyone wants to hear. The brave and heroic wife who fought her way to freedom and returned to be reunited with her family. At the same time, we see the police detective begin to question that narrative with information that should cast enormous doubt on her story. He pushed inside. And he grabbed me. But I got away and ran to the kitchen. And he clubbed me. I collapsed. That club was actually the handle to a Punch and Judy puppet. Right. Treasure hunt. I... I'd hidden some puppets at Ghost. Then how did Desi have that handle? I just found it. It must have fallen off. I w was holding it when Desi pushed in, so he got it from me. About that wood ship. He took me to his lake house, tied me to his bed. Back to the woodshed, real quick, real quick. When you went to place the puppets there, did you notice that it was packed? Lots of stuff. Corresponding to purchases made on credit cards in your husband's name. Nick and credit cards. He buys, I nag, I don't know, probably. He hid a lot of stuff at Ghost. They're very close. Now, may I go back to where I was being held prisoner by a man with a history of mental problems? Please continue, Miss Dunn. But nobody in the room is interested in this information because the general audience only cares about the neat, tidy, heroic drama which they've been fed. They have a clear villain and a clear hero, and everything else doesn't matter. From the beginning of their marriage, they're only interested in their perceived version of each other. Nick puts on the charm and glib personality that attracts her, and she fills the role of cool girl that she knows all men fantasise about. But when those masks slip, as life problems begin to mount, neither is happy with the real person. They both pine for the fantasy version they first met. They simultaneously acknowledge who the real person is by talking in third person about how they believe other people perceive who they are. Promise me we'll never be like them. Like who? All those awful couples we know, those wives who treat their men like dancing monkeys, to be trained and paraded. Husbands who treat their wives like the highway patrol, the outfoxed and avoided. They know the truth, but instantly retreat into the lie again. And so do we. Because like them, we want to believe those stereotypes aren't who we are or who we become. We want to believe that we're different. This pattern of accepting whatever supports our personal beliefs continues right up until the point where it's no longer ambiguous anymore. When Amy returns full of the blood of the guy she just framed and murdered, Nick knows the truth. You fucking bitch. The Amy he loved never existed. When they talk in the shower, Amy knows the truth too. The Nick she loves doesn't exist. But it's what she wants. In order to get what she wants, she's willing to give Nick what he wants. Cool girl is hot. 
Cool girl is game. Cool girl is fun. Cool girl never gets angry at her man. She only smiles in a chagrin, loving manner, and then presents her mouth for fucking. She likes what he likes. The movie ends when Amy gives Nick the one thing that she knew would convert him. A baby. He knows the truth, and he threatens to leave and reveal the lie to everyone. After telling him to sleep on it, he does eventually accept the marriage regardless of how crazy and toxic it is. Worse than that, it's not just acceptance, it's what he actually wants. And you know it. It's gonna be my child. I'm not gonna leave it. You wanna stay? I have a responsibility. It's not about what I want anymore. You wanna stay with her? <gasps> Both people have finally been honest about their lies and realised that they were lying about wanting honesty. By the time we've been through this journey sifting through a sea of information, we've learned that Nick isn't the model husband he presented himself to be. We've learned that Amy isn't the cool girl wife that she presented herself to be. For the first time, she sees the cheating liar she married and he sees the murderous psychopath that she's always been. The lies are stripped away, but they don't care. They are happy to believe and live the acceptable lie instead of the uncomfortable truth. He'll do that all by himself. Oh, oh God! I'm the cunt you married. The only time you liked yourself was when you were trying to be someone this cunt might like. I'm not a queen.